This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Daniel Solinger. How are you doing, Daniel? I'm doing great. Yeah. Good to see you, my friend. You and I have we have uh, cr- we've we have uh, cr- we have fought the same battles. We've been in the same trenches. We have uh, walked over the same bodies. <laughs> In, true. in independent film, man. So I was so happy when you reached out to me about coming on the show because you're a wealth of information. Uh, you've done, I mean, you, you've definitely have done the indie film hustle. Uh, <laughs> and then 30 some. years of indie film hustling, yes. And then some. Um, so I have to, st- let's start the conversation, my friend, is how and why did you decide to get into this insanity that is the film industry, mm-hmm. let alone the indie film industry? <laughs> Well, you know, that's a great question. I just want to start off just saying, like, how much fun it has been to watch Indie Film Hustle grow and expand. And, you know, um, you're such a great entrepreneur, too. I always use you you as an example to young filmmakers who are, you know, maybe have a movie that doesn't have stars or whatever. And I say, there's you just have to find a unique way to do it. I know this guy, Alex, who when the iPhone came out, he took his short film, he turned it into an app. And sold it on the app store like you just have to find the new way to do it to monetize your film and make it successful you know so i love what you do and and uh i'm glad to be here i mean i the the long story is is that when i was in high school uh, my parents did not want us to watch movies or television they wanted us to read books um i became very rebellious i got kicked out of one high school i went to another high school i got kicked out of that high school and i i went to the end of the line which was a a night school for sort of disciplinary problem people, children. And while I was in night school, I met another kid who was kicked out of this thing called the Fine Arts Center. This is in Greenville, South Carolina. And um, he was studying film. And it was just like a light bulb went off. I was like, you can study film? Like, that can be a career? Like, it just it just blew my mind. And I had no experience whatsoever, but I, I, I had been writing a lot of poetry, and I submitted all my poetry to the Fine Arts Center. And... God bless Dennis. You see the, the, the teacher there. Uh, he uh, he accepted me into the program. I'd go half the day to my regular high school. And then I went half the day and studied film at the Fine Arts Center. And, you know, then I applied to NYU and went to NYU film school and, um, you know, built a career from that. I love making movies. I love telling stories, you know. And when I was uh, getting out of NYU, I sort of I think I, there was sort of like a decision point. It's like, do I want to be a PA on big movies, you know? Um, or do I want to produce music videos? Because I was producing, I was producing music videos before I graduated, and I said, you know what? I want to be a producer. I'm just going to start producing music videos, and someday I'll, I'll be producing big movies. But I'm just going to produce because that's what I like to do. You know, I don't want to PA for ten years. You know, I, I, I meet, you know, God bless them. You know, and nothing wrong with it. But I meet like sixty-year-old second ads and just wonder like. I just didn't want to get caught in uh-huh. like uh, a, like a smaller role on a bigger movie. Like I wanted to have the the enjoyment of producing from the beginning, you know. Yeah, I mean, I've run into a couple of forty five, fifty year old PAs, and that's that's a, that's tough. It's a tough gig, man. It's a tough gig yeah. getting, getting caught up in that. And there's nothing that's just wrong with it, man. But PAing is a young man's game, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Things things hurt now that did not hurt in your twenties, <laughs> like walking. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, if you know if you know when it's going to rain by the pain in your knee, you might have jumped the shark. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now you made your bones coming up as a first AD and a line producer in the UPM. Um, can you tell the different, can you tell me the difference between a UPM, a unit production manager and a line producer? Cause that's a confusion a lot of filmmakers have. Sure. Well, yeah, I have a lot to say about it actually. So I'm a DGA UPM. I'm a director's guild of America UPM. And, um, even if I'm doing a job as a producer and it's a DGA show, I will take the UPM credit so that I get the you know, health, pension and welfare benefits and everything. So that's so that that's there's still uh, a lot of room. And, and I'm not the only one. There's like huge producers like Daniel Lupe. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of, you know, big Hollywood producers that when they produce a movie, they they uh, are the UPM as well. So the UPM is um, the person in charge of, you know, breaking down the script, creating a schedule, turning that information, the breakdown in the schedule into a budget 
then hiring the crew and making sure everything stays on track in terms of schedule and budget all the way through to the end of production. So that's that's what a UPM does. Um, the uh, line producer, I think, is a little bit more of an indie role, and it's 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 a step up. So the UPM will work underneath the line producer. The line producer will be their supervisor, and uh, the line producer looks at more at the big picture of the production. And the UPM is making sure lunch is there on time and 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 taking care of the the smaller details to make sure that all the smaller details are hitting all the places that they're supposed to be. So you, even though you might be line producing, you'll take a UPM credit. Even if I'm just full producer, you know, I'll take a, a UPM credit if it's a Directors Guild of America uh, movie. Absolutely. Right. And you being yeah. a DG and you being a union DG, uh, a union member, you have to basically work on projects that are union, um, right. DGA generally. Well, luckily in my category, that's a big loophole because yes, I cannot work on a non-union movie as a unit production manager. I can work on a non-union movie as a line producer, as a producer. So it. um, it's a lot harder for union ADs because there's no other sort of title that really fits. Right. You know, so and and the DGA is they're they are really serious about it too. If I work on a non-union movie as a unit production manager, my penalty if they find out and 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 discipline me is my entire salary from that project. So it's a very serious deal. That that uh, well, we won't get into the, how fair that is or not fair that is. Um, but uh, now, are there well, any there's, there's other things you can do? You can go FICOR, which is financial right. core, so that you can get the benefits of being union and be non-union. I mean, there's there's ways to deal with it. But if you're if you're doing everything by the book, I mean, that's the potential penalty that you face. Well, yeah, I know. Isn't I mean, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino, the you know George Lucas, they're all non-GGA. And they still work on DGA projects and films, right. but they're FICOR, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. So they're, and it's a, it's like the, the DGA doesn't generally like to talk a lot about, <laughs> like the, we don't, we don't no, talk no, about no. Quentin Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but no, I mean, listen, I heard, I've heard nothing great, but great things about the DGA. I know that they have probably the best benefits package out of all the unions in Hollywood, uh, pension package. I mean, it's pretty insane. Yeah. It's pretty it's insane. very nice. And beyond that, too, I, I'm a huge fan of the DGA. You mm -hmm. know, they a decade ago, they spent two million dollars to commission a study about where they thought online viewing would go. Right. <laughs> At the time, you know, I think YouTube was just starting to really kick in. You know, people were doing webisodes. I don't know if you remember those. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, but there was very, very, very little revenue in it. And because they commissioned this study, they learned what anchor points they needed to put into the contracts so that people who were working in new media felt free to go DGA. Um, but as as it grew, like the DGA would grow with it and the and the parity of compensation would grow with it. And um, I they're the they're it, well, it's directors in U, UPM. So it's like the best run union. You know, there's very little drama. Everything's like boom, boom, boom by the book very healthy pension, um, uh, their reserves in their pension, you know, the reserves for the operating overall are like really, uh, abundant, you know, and it's just a incredibly well-run union. I think the best union, and I think the, all the other unions follow them. So, you know, I think in terms of the contract cycles, like DGA is like the first up and then a lot of the other unions will sort of follow their lead. And when they go into their negotiations. Yeah. It's, if you can, if you can get it, uh, it's great. Um, it, it really is, but you have to follow the rules. There's no question about yeah. it. Don't do not play around. They 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 don't play. <laughs> yeah, and rules. You know, rules are 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 there for a reason too. I mean, you know, you know, when you think about set set safety, liability. Oh, you know, of course. Yeah. You know, um, you know, the rules can be restrictive and and challenging at times, but but they're there to protect the the members and you know uh, and the inst the institution as a whole and filmmaking in general, you know? Now, you and I worked on a project years ago uh, called Without Men, starring the lovely Eva Longoria, who was just on the show. Yeah. I, and that was not planned, by the way. I didn't plan on having you. <laughs> you reached out to me before Eva was even scheduled to be on the show, but it just so was was funny. And I talked to her a little bit about the show, the, the, about the movie. She's like, oh my God, I forgot. You know, that's amazing. I can't believe you worked on it. And that movie was a really interesting experience for me because we're, we're going back, it was released in 10 years ago. 10, 11 years ago, 
about 11 Good years ago, um, that that was released. And we were working on it in 2010. I think it was being filmed in 2010, 2009, right. 2009, 2010, something like that. And, um, I, you know, it had Christian Slater in it. It had um, uh, uh, Castillo, K. Castillo. K. Castillo, Paul Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah. Paul Rodriguez. It had, a, it had a really great cast. And uh, it was shot outside of L.A. It was, I think, outside the – the whatchamacallit? What is the, that? The, the, the zone. They call it the zone. It's 30 miles radius from the – Screen Actors Guild headquarters. Yeah, so it was outside the zone. Yeah, it was outside the zone. So technically, you could do a non-union scenario there, and I think that's uh, for for a crew, not for DGA or other things, but for crew. So I remember when we were on that that uh, that project was flipped. Now, can you yeah. explain what flipping a movie means and how you handled it? Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, so flipping is when a when the crew decides that they want to organize and uh, collectively bargain with the the producers. Um, and so you know I do both union and non-union work, um, both as you know as a union member, you know in my category, but also you know all the other trade unions uh, involved. And um, so uh, usually when I start a project, I we make a decision can. And it always comes down to money. Can we afford to go union? Like my default is, is like I would prefer to go union because union, yeah. like your basement level quality of work is higher. Period. Period. Sure. It's like your your worst guy on a union crew is better than the average guy on a non-union crew. In my experience, this mm -hmm. is just my experience. So, um, uh, but you know, you there's a tremendous cost impact of that. Uh, I think at the moment it's around. An extra two hundred and twenty dollars per day per person, uh, just in benefits. Uh, so that adds up to six figures very quickly. And if you know, if you're really trying to, you know, get something done, uh, you know, sometimes there's just not the room to do that. Which was the case in uh, that movie. Um, by the way, love Eva. Loved working with her. Mm -hmm. Never such a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And. Um, so, you know, we had a very limited – we actually didn't have full financing. You know, we had enough to get it in the can. We didn't even have the money for post, I think, when we started out, and um, which is why I think uh, it took another eight months before we were like, okay, let's finish um, this I, I, Literally, I had uh, all the raw files on a hard drive, on multiple hard drives sitting in my office, and I would call you every every month. I'm like, hey, man, um, do you want me to finish this Eva Longoria Christian Slater movie? <laughs> Well, that was the reason why. Okay. And, and um, so, like I said, we had just, uh, you know, we had just enough to get get us through production. So we, we told everybody going into it, this is non-union film. When we hired the crew, you know, we can't afford to go union. You know, we're, we're going to have to do this non-union. And mostly we hired non-union people. Um, I, I find that when you have talent at a certain visibility, that that becomes more and more untenable that that um i I, be, I believe i don't know who or where i i i think that they unions look at a project and they say look if, you know if you can if you've got even longoria or you know whoever i'm just using her in the example of this movie like you can you should really be union and you know, i think that's sort of like the mindset and you know uh and they're entitled to that so then what happens is you're shooting with this crew that you believe is non-union and it doesn't matter if they're union members or not it's it's a little bit more difficult uh if they are union members to stay non-union because the union then applies pressure on them if the dp is union you know they'll get a call from the union and say look we, we it looks like you're working on a non-union production you know uh that's not okay you know we you know uh, we need help you know organizing the uh organizing the shoot and by organizing if you can get 50% of the crew to sign on uh, and agree to be represented, then the union then becomes the representative for the crew. And what, what, what happens is they stop work. You know, uh, they usually do it um, on a lunch break or at the beginning of a day. And you, no work happens until you work out a, a, a deal with, the, you know, a contract with the union. And that, that did happen on that project. It was um... – it was really interesting because 
uh, when I was when I was coming up, there was a movie that I worked on in Florida, and it was um, it, believe it or not, it was like a million dollar budget. But most of that money was going towards cast. It was a very poorly it was a very poorly yeah. run <laughs> project. And um, back in this was years, 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 the mid two thousands, early two thousands. And uh, I remember the day uh, I was doing all the post on it, and it had like an Academy Award nominee in it, and a couple other people in it. And then the union showed up because it was non-union. This was in Florida because Florida is yeah. a right to work state. So you don't have to right. go. But the union came because saw, they saw the trucks and everything. And they're like, so and, – and luckily that day, none of the major cast was there. It was all kind of like the, 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 the non-bankable names were there. And all of a sudden, they, they looked and they saw the camera that we were using. And it was the DVX 100A Panasonic Mini DV camera shooting a million dollar movie with the Panasonic DVA 100 million. Wow. And they said, literally, they're like, you guys have a great day. And literally, all of them just walked out the door. <laughs> they were done. They were just like, these, oh, uh, these guys are obviously, I don't care if you've got Meryl Streep here, you're shooting with this camera. You obviously don't have the money to pay us. <laughs> but that's. But that's the uh, that's the world, and, th- and these are the kind of things that UPMs and line producers have to deal with. That the filmmakers generally don't need to even know about until they go. Why are my cre- why isn't my crew working? Where's the cr- why is the crew across the street? It's call time. <laughs> exactly. At that point, they go. You know, oh, <laughs> I I, I want to go in a little bit more detail about uh, without men. And, yeah. and the flip because uh, now that it's ten years past, I feel like I could divulge some things that I wouldn't normally have 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 divulged in the sure. time. Um, but, um, so you can, as a producer, you can usually see a flip coming. It's not a surprise the day that the, the crew is, is not working. Um, there's usually, you know, there's back rumbles, you get there's rumbles, you, yeah. you feel it, you feel it happening. So I, well, I saw this coming and, and this is a, a project that are, it was all in one location. We had, we had had this great situation. It's, it was a film school. I don't think they exist anymore, actually. Um, and and their, the name of the film school escapes me, but they had this soundstage and they had this uh, Mexican village um, back lot and it was perfect for our movie. And so we struck a deal. You know, we hired students to and um, and so we just landed at this film school and we shot our whole movie on their on their back lot and soundstage. It was it was a, it was a great situation, especially, you know, with limited means. So. Whenever a flip happens, there's a, there's some negotiating that goes on, you know, like you can you can get there's some things that they will not budge about on their contract. There's like minimum staffing requirements. You have to pay all the pension and welfare retro retroactively. There's a lot that there's a lot that that is uh, that you're not going to be able to negotiate. But there's all these other deal points that you can go that are more negotiable. So. When uh, I knew the flip was coming, the morning of the flip was there and the crew went across the street and they all had their walkie talkies. And so I went around to all the film students. and I said, OK, you're the you're the well, we are AD staff. It wasn't flip DJ. So our AD staff was still on. But, you know, I said, OK, you're the camera person. You're the you're the you're the this you're the that you're the and I gave all the students assignments and I said, Use the walkies a lot. Just every, every. I told the AD anything. You just you move, you're moving the camera over two inches. Put it on the walkie, right? And 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 then I waited, right? And I and the union representative was expecting me to call him and be like, um, "Let's work out something. We're not getting anything done." But instead, the whole crew was sitting there listening to their walkies, and it's like, "All right, roll camera. Okay, we're moving on." You know, and and we were just shooting without them. You know. And they were flipping out. And so they started to put a lot of pressure on their union representative to to contact me and work out some sort of deal. And I may have even like not answered the guy's phone call the first couple of times. He was trying to call me. And 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 he finally got a hold of me. He's like, look, man, we really have to work something out here. I was like, uh, you know, OK, well, I'll talk to you. Why don't you come in and talk? And I worked out like the best possible deal I've ever had on a flip. I've been flipped about seven times, but just like just the barest 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 minimums uh of like what i had to comply with and um and then you know the crew came back and we everybody hugged and we went on and you know the Spent. unions want the union it's a good to have a win-win the union won because they 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 uh you know they they flipped us and we won because it was like really um not a high impact on us financially and and you know and then we and we got the movie made and that happened i guess by lunchtime i think the crew was back you know oh wow so it was pretty and, and it was pretty quick 
they, of course, the, the camera department like destroyed the cards that the students had been shooting with. But, <laughs> but, um, but it was, it was it turned out to be like a you know like a very effective. Um, you know, it almost, gambit, but, it almost sounded yeah. like a hostage situation. You're like, <laughs> you have to call in and like, they're not picking up the call. What do they want? I don't know. We'd send food uh, or, and we'll send out one, re- we'll release one hostage. Like it. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. Now, are there any uh, tricks of the trade that you can kind of give advice on uh, when it comes to line producing a project or, or UPMing a project? Well, I just heard this this week and i and i love this somebody said you know daniel we're going to fix it in prep <laughs> what a great you know, what a great war. oh my god that's amazing that's so usually great. you're on set it's like oh we'll fix it in post no fix it in prep you know like the you know like that's the best thing you can do to yourself even if you don't have the money to you know pay people to do like extensive prep just do as much prep as you can i, I work on this tv show called uh, double cross and the producers on that show, um, they'll start out months in advance, location scout, they'll do all, all this prep work on their own so that by the time it gets the week before shooting, like so much is done and the crew just sort of drops into this situation that they've already set up every, you know, it's like they know all their cast, they know all their locations, they know they've got, you know, they know all their props, they know how they're doing everything and the crew just sort of drops in and they go. and. You know, I, I don't think that's that's an interesting way to work. That's not the way I would normally do it. But but it's amazing how much if you do enough prep, you won't have problems during production. It's just that simple, you know. That, yeah, absolutely. Prep is it's so undervalued. <laughs> prepare, 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 prepare. Now, exactly. what are some mistakes that you see filmmakers make when they're trying to produce their first low budget mm-hmm independent mm-hmm. film i'm sure you've seen you've you've been witness might have even been a part of early in your career oh, no, i was just thinking about all the mistakes i've made like i don't even know where to start you know but <laughs> but um you know top, top uh, five top five mistakes <laughs> <laughs> yeah um as well just back for a second of what you were saying about that shoot in florida you know i'm i very often get i do a lot of you know breakdown schedules and budgets for for movies that are fundraising or trying to get greenlit and what right. have you and um, if there is too much discrepancy between the above the line and the below the line, that is not a good look. That's so you mean so, so seven fifty for the talent and two fifty right. per production? A little heavy, a little heavy on the on the talent side. Well, a good rule of thumb is that the, those should line up. So if you're spending a half million above the line, you should be spending at least a half million below the line. Like, Got it. Like that's res- to me, that's responsible producing. So yeah. So if the ratio between what the above the line and what the below the line are getting is too off. It's just, it's, that's, that's a, a recipe for disaster for a lot of way, reasons, you know, because you're above the line or in a movie that looks like garbage, you know, like, you, you know, like, and, yeah. and then they're not happy about that. And then you have to deal the, with the repercussions of that, or they're expecting a certain level of um, professionalism that, that you just can't afford if you've done right. it that way, you know? So the, the, the stars, your, your big name stars or whatever that you're expecting to use on your, your, marketing and bring the money back you know they arrive on set and they're like this is a joke i i can't work in this under these conditions and you know and it causes you know it can cause just tremendous problems so there should always be a parity between uh you know at least a one-to-one ratio between the above the line and the below the line spend that would be my 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 piece of advice number one (laughs) all right Uh, yeah because i mean there's been so many god there's just so many things like well, there's one thing I remember when I was doing my movie, my $20 million movie for the mob back in the day, uh, I was I had the pleasure of being mentored by a legendary first AD. Uh, and uh, he was a line, he was a line producer on some David Fincher films like he was, he was the real deal. Like he was he worked on Love Story in the 70s. Like he was, wow. he'd been all right. He was, he was in the room on Taxi Driver when when uh robert was like are you talking to me like he was in that room he was in the room with marty so he was a new york guy he was an east coast guy so i was i had the pleasure of working with him uh for for months and he trained me on how to just taught me on how to break down a movie how to schedule Mm -hmm. a movie and then i discovered how he was able to hide money in other departments, can you talk right. about that little trick? And it's not a, it's not, it's not notorious or anything like that. It's an actual, yeah. really very valuable tool to to have. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Because when you're creating a budget, you know, first of all, things happen. Surprises happen. Things come up. You've always need to be aware of that. Number one. So, um, you know, uh, you should always have overtime budgeted. Some overtime. I I usually start at ten percent, and every budget I do, there's like an you know, a 10% overtime, you should always have a contingency uh, in place. And, and, and hopefully you don't spend it, but, but trying to do, uh, this is another mistake I see a lot of young producers make where they'll like make a million dollar film and then their contingency will be like $10,000, you know, like you should have a 10% contingency, <laughs> you know, right. and, um, but then also inside the budget, there should be areas or, or, or places that you know that you've over budgeted or, you know, like, I can get a much better deal with this vendor than I'm putting in here, you know, but I'm going to put this in here because this is what it would cost if it was just a regular uh, normal vendor relationship, you know? And so you, you find all these little pockets and then when things start going wrong, things happen and I can't even begin to, you know, you know, as well as I do, anybody who makes a film knows it, it, it never goes 100% according to the plan. Um, then you have these little pockets that, Oh, we have this, we have a union flip. You know, we need to find an extra 40 grand somewhere, you know. So, you know, oh, well, if we take this pad out of here and this pad out of here and we use our contingency and reduce our overtime budget to 5 percent, then we, we, we have the money, you know. So so those those little pads and pockets are, are, are really good. Now, on the converse, you have to be very careful too, um, to not get in the habit of quoting the department heads. Uh, the wrong uh, misleading numbers. So let's say you have, you know, uh, a five thousand dollar, you know, budget for the the wardrobe department. You know, uh, it's very easy to get in the habit of saying that you have three thousand, and then try to act keep that as pad. And if they go over, let's say they go over a thousand, then you're you're still a thousand under. And and I've I've done that a lot, and uh, but it's a habit I'm trying to get myself off of because. If you can be just fully transparent, these are the same numbers as my budget. Um, if you're dealing with professionals, like that's a much better and more effective way to go. So, so you have to be careful where you put those pads that they're they're you know that you're not depending on somebody else to overperform in order to have that pad. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I agree with you on on the professional standpoint. Like if you're dealing with union professionals or people who are very seasoned, I get that. But maybe when you're dealing on a lower budget film, when the department heads aren't as seasoned, that technique might work. And this is the art of being a line producer. This is this little it is part of the art of line producing. Yeah, yeah, it's the art of line producing because you've got to kind of like, okay, you gotta you check out the 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 crew, check out what's going on, check out the director, check out the producer, who's how much experience do these people have? Do you think they're gonna go over and and things like that? And 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 sometimes you have to have those little tricks in order yeah, to keep I mean, because I'm it's not, your I'm job not saying i never do it anymore but but i i have a, a a line producer whose work i really highly respect and is as operates at a, at a at a higher level than me and you know he told me like i always give them my real numbers and i was like wow it was just like wow you know like okay it's sort of like you having that that conversation with that ad and you just sort of you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I see why, you know, at the at the top level, this is the way it works, you know? Right, yeah, like I was, when I was talking to um, Ridley Scott's costume designer, you can give her, she's an Oscar winner, you can give right. her the exact budget. You, you can you, give her your You don't numbers. play around with someone of that, of that caliber because exactly. they're professionals. They've done this a thousand exactly. times. It's fine. But if you've got someone who's maybe done one or two shows and you just don't know, you've got to protect the – you've got to protect not only – yourself but it's your job to make sure that this ship doesn't sink and if you don't have that leeway that you're just talking about that contingency when stuff happens which will happen and every project it will happen then you're the whole thing can come, come crashing down like the, you can't finish yeah. the movie so in many ways i mean that's a lot of pressure on the line producer really truly it is it truly is a lot of pressure on the upm and the, and the line producer because they've got to they're the they're responsible for keeping the engine going. They're not the creative right. producer. They're the they're the nuts and bolts producer. Well, and and it's it's interesting too because often the crew will consider them the enemy and that think that they're trying to get over on them or manipulate them, which is one of the reasons why I was uh, saying like it's, it's best when you can give the real numbers. But um, but what I always say to the crew that's that's unhappy with me because I'm not giving them all the things that they they want. <laughs> right. is they, I'm in charge of making sure your last paycheck clears. 
right? If, if we <laughs> if we spend all the money and and your paycheck bounces, like that's you don't want that to happen any more than I do. So if I tell you that we don't have the money, we don't have the money, you know, and there's we can't talk about it anymore. <laughs> right. And, and and a lot of times, especially when you have crews are coming in from the studio system who are, are just used to all the toys and they also know the depth that a studio has. They're like, oh, if you go over 100,000, right. n- no one's going to blink too much. If you go over right. a million, there's going to be a conversation, but the movie's going to get finished. You're going to get your final check right. from Universal. Right. But when yeah. you're in the indie world, when the money runs out, you better go find some dentist. <laughs> right. It's true. It's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. I've been there and it's painful. It's it, painful. I, yeah. Especially when you're in the poor director and the poor cast and the poor, the creatives behind everything. They're just like, what's, what's going, what's going on. So it is, it's truly one of the more important positions you can hire on is a good, good line producer who knows absolutely. how to plays, who knows how to play with the numbers and make things work. And it is, it is, I mean, watching, watching my, um, my 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 line producing first ad mentor work on that project all those years ago i would just see how he would just move and let's not even get into scheduling that is a whole other art form between schedules and this and that and the actor and the location and oh god you know this uh, one of our one of our issues that we had was like oh the turtles are in mating season and we can't shoot on the water so we have to move things around like it was these are the things you have oh. to deal with. These are this is the non-sexy stuff, right? <laughs> it's true. This is the stuff that we're talking it's about. True. So unsexy because all they teach in film school is like, look at the cool lens. Let's watch Citizen right. Kane. Look at the new red and the Alexa, and let's and let's go watch a Darren Aronofsky movie, and right. and, and you know and 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 wax poetic about it. But at the end of the day, <laughs> this is what right. makes the movies. This right. is what gets these movies finished. And you you know and. It's what they don't teach you is that sometimes a, a small hand prop can grind the entire production down to the hall. <laughs> to a hall, you know, like you know, it's like you know the the it, the, the the director didn't see it that you know be, before the it, it's needed on camera. The prop person brings it, and the and the director's like, "This is I can't work with this. This doesn't. This is not what I need for this the scene." And then production stops until somebody runs out and gets exactly what the director uh, needs. You know. And yeah, they don't teach you that in film school. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Now, what was, in your opinion, one of the worst days you've ever had on set? I know, you, you, I know, you, like a shiver went down his spine. Well, if, okay, if you're so not I've, watching I've, this, <laughs> I've done 65 movies, 400 short form content. So you've like, done a lot. Uh, done. So is yeah, there yeah, is yeah. there one so, that stands out? And yeah, then also, I'll, how I'll did you and how did you overcome it? Like that's always my yeah. question. Like, and how did you overcome it that day? Okay, that, that that those are good questions. So I'll start the the, the hardest one that that, that I, I eventually did overcome um, was uh, hired hired by somebody you know very um, very late in the prep process, uh, like we're, we got to shoot next week, kind of late, and um, find out after shooting three weeks that they had spent all the money that they were given to make the movie all but like 40 or 50 grand on i don't know what i i suspect leisurely activities for lack of a better word and um (laughs) but that they they and it was a foreign production and they didn't have uh an american llc so i formed an llc just to put all this money through and so that we could operate as a as an american production and then basically, you know, actually it was it was like a three week shoot and two weeks into it, I realized the money isn't there. There's no money, you know, and it was right before Christmas. And oh. I had about one hundred and thirty people who weren't paid oh. and it was all on me. I was the LLC sole sole member of the LLC oh. um, and it was all on me. And wow, that w- I woke up every morning and so much pain and i had to go and just knock on doors 24 7 until i got the money to pay the people and uh it took it took like three months you know and and then the money to finish the film uh so that's that's something that you never want to go through um and um but 
you know, you come out of it stronger. Like there's, I've had so many experiences. The, the other story I want to tell about is the time we blew up a town, like literally. But um, the, uh, I'll tell that story and then just say that, you know, now when I go onto a shoot, you know, it's, there's very little that phases me. There's a, one of my favorite movies is, you know, uh, Wag the Dog, where Dustin yes. Hoffman plays the producer. And, you know, there'll be a problem that will come up in what they're trying to do in that movie. And I'll go like, this is nothing. You know, I was shooting four horsemen of the apocalypse and three of the horsemen died. This is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, um, and, and that's the way you, you start to feel is like, you know, whatever the problems come up, you're like, look, I lived through this thing. I lived through that thing. We're going to get through this somehow. I, one of my mottos now is like, a problem cannot existentially exist without a solution. You know, like it's just, it, it's, it's not possible for a problem to exist without there being a solution. So, you know, that's the attitude I took. We were doing this movie, The Alphabet Killer. Um, <laughs> fun movie. I, it's a good movie. I'm very proud of it. And um, our grip truck was pulling out of the parking lot after we'd packed up one location. We were doing a company move to another location where we were shooting Martin Donovan and Melissa Leo, who we only had for one day. Like, they were going back to their to their other projects or whatever at the, at the, the, the next morning. The grip truck grabs a power line, pulls the power line, two telephone poles with transformers snap. Now, what I didn't know that is that transformers are full of oil. So when they hit the ground, they exploded. And they, the, the, the explosion, of uh, the oil like flew onto our still photographer's car and completely incinerated his car, incinerated the, the, the hotel next to the location we were at. We had, you know, a huge, luckily, Thank, thank goodness nobody was hurt, but a huge fireball like came towards our first AD, our second AD, and like burned off her eyebrows. And you know this fire mayhem, the explosion was enormous. You could hear it miles away, you know. And um, you know, and and we had to get, we had to, we only had Melissa Leo for one day. And so, first of all, we made sure everybody was okay. Sure, of course. Anybody who was traumatized, we told them, go back to the hotel, right? Then I had to go and talk to the fire department and who had now cordoned off, you know, like several square blocks. And I was like, look, um, is there any way I can get to my camera truck <laughs> to pull off my camera because um, we have to keep shooting? And he's like, okay, we'll let you, you know, we'll, we'll have an escort. You can go and pull out your camera. What he didn't realize, he thought it was a camera. It was actually... 15 cases of course <laughs> and so i had I, I i grabbed a hand truck and i'm like pulling 15 cases off and like throwing them onto the hand truck the fire the fire guy who came with me is looking at me like i can't believe you are doing this right now we freaking pulled the camera out i i don't i think there was a supplemental truck maybe it was the grip truck that pulled down the the, mm -hmm. the thing and we had an electric truck that had lights and enough grip gear to get by did the company move shot martin and melissa made our day you know and uh, the insu you know, and the insurance claim was like, oh, the funny thing is, is, is right after it happened, you know, it was just mayhem. I turned to Martin Donovan and I said, can you believe this? And he's like, no, this is like the second time this has happened to me. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, we made our day. You know, the insurance claim went on for years. The city was battling the, 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 the film insurance company because, you know, the film company's position was that the line should never have been hanging low enough for the truck to grab it you know the the insurance the, the 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 city's insurance company felt like we were driving in a place that we shouldn't have been driving and therefore it was our fault so that went on for years and years but you know again one of those experiences that you make your way through and you become a stronger <laughs> this you know like, producer okay, we didn't pull up a town this time and you know everything's okay you know um and another lesson is make sure you have production insurance uh make sure you have yeah, production insurance sure, definitely. do not definitely. go anywhere without production insurance now you've worked yeah. on a ton of movies over the years can you you know and you've seen the business change i mean you were there when dvd was the king and you could just put something out Before and dvd was king yeah uh, yeah but like when that was like the, the heyday when everybody was making just obscene yeah. amounts of money is during the yeah. I'm going to say the late 80s, late 90s to probably right. like 2010. That's right. when you could just pre-sell stuff and DVD sales. Like you could make Sniper yeah. 52 and, and it just would go and get sold all over the world. Um, you Now you – I mean obviously you're making movies now as well. How important is it 
to have bankable stars in your films and I mean obviously that's a that's a kind of a dumb question as we all like hey we all we need stars in our movie but it all depends mm-hmm. on the I always tell people it depends on the budget and the genre right if you're making that's, an that's it, it, you can make a not you can make action you can make horror you can make thrillers with maybe some recognizable faces or even some unknowns if the budget's low enough but once right, you start yeah. breaking a certain budget threshold it's irresponsible of you in today's world not to have mm. some sort of bankable cast. What do you think? Well, I, you know, uh, talent is the coin of the realm. So you, you, it doesn't just matter to the people selling the film. Like the, I make a new film. So the, 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 the normal sort of by the numbers process is you make the film, you get into a big film festival, you get a sales agent, you get a publicist, you go to the festival, you create a lot of hype, you sell it to a distributor, they put it out, right? Film festivals, when they look at your movie, are thinking, who is going to bring the most press to my film festival? So it's not even the people who are buying it. The, the sales agent is looking at your film and saying, it's a good film, but I don't know anybody in it, and you know, you're, you're going to have to go find another agent. You know, like, like it, it, it ripples in all these, you know, the publicists. The casting, you would be surprised. Even like if you go to a, you know, one of the top casting directors and you say, "I've got this mo- this great movie, that, you know, and it's got this person already attached," you know, versus, "I've got this great movie and nobody's attached." It could be the difference between like that top casting director saying yes or no to your project, you know. So it's it's not just you you can't just think about it in terms of the um, the you know the name on the 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 DVD box cover or on the the thumbnail on the streaming service. You know, it, it ripples all the way down, you know, and, and you find you get better crew, too. It's like, oh, you know, oh, this has got a project with that name in it. OK, I'm in, you know, but whereas, well, you know, the pay is OK or it's not usually what I get. But, you know, and there's nobody in it. You know, I, you know, I'll, t- I'll do a commercial that week, you know, and make more money than, you know, in one day than I would make a week on your film. You know, so it, it, it matters all the way down the line, unfortunately. Um, however, not everybody can do it. It's not easy. You know, it's, it's getting cast attached can take forever. And, you know, it's, it's a big, uh, rigmarole. And if you can't do that, and if your budget's so small or whatever, you can't do that, then you have to do something innovative like you did, you know, uh, putting it as an app on the ice. You know, I, I know a guy who figured out SEO. This was, this was years ago. He did a wrestling movie with no, no stars, but what he did was, you know, he, he knew how to work Google so that anytime somebody typed in wrestling, the first result would be his movie. And you went to his website and you bought it for 30 bucks. And, and, sure, he, he, did and well. he, made a, he, he turned a 300, he spent 300 grand to make the movie and he, and he sold a million dollars worth of DVDs, you know? And so if you're not, if you don't have that, you better have like a, a unique and, and, and well thought out business plan of, of how you will recoup your money without names. Right. And and then uh, that's why I wrote a whole book about being a film entrepreneur, which is about mm-hmm. finding mm-hmm. a niche and finding yep. a niche and serving that niche. And you don't need to have, uh, you know, Adrian Brody uh, in your in your film uh, if you have a, a, a movie that is focused on a specific audience that, you know, and I always I always use the Vegan Chef movie as my example, but something along those lines where you could target that audience. So it is doable. But again, that also limits on budget i wouldn't suggest right. doing a five million dollar budget film with no stars attached or no bankable stars no. attached for a film entrepreneur release unless you have deep connections into in a massive niche audience that you can sell to it's not impossible right. but right. it's so i mean you know how hard it is to make a, a million dollars in yeah. re- rentals uh right. avod and and tvod and svod it's tough with no stars. Right. It's tough in today's world. It's just too much competition. And it, it's true. It's true. Although this gives me a great, because you brought up Adrian, this gives me a great opportunity to, to pivot to the movie that I got coming yes. out tomorrow, yeah. which is clean and it stars Adrian Brody and having him on board changed a lot of things, you know, oh, like, sure. you know, we want CAA to be the sales agent. I went and screened it with their head, their film division, you know, in their screening room, you know, um, you know, the festivals were a lot more, you know, like, and, and we got, uh, you know, we got our casting director sort of like that I was saying is a top, top casting director who came on board because the, the, they wanted that, that relationship, you know, 
And um, just all the way down the line, it, it, it opened doors and opportunities. Um, just on top of that, Adrian is a phenomenal creative partner and, and is, works harder than anybody else to ensure the success of the movie. You know, which is the fringe benefit of it. It's not just the name. It's it's also what they're bringing to. They're a name for a reason. You know, like they're bringing. You know, all of this knowledge, expertise, connections, um, and and benefits just in terms of because they have uh, distinguished themselves through talent and hard work. You know. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Clean because I saw the trailer for it, and it's going to be in the show notes if everybody wants to watch it. Uh, it looks badass. It looks really beautifully produced and beautifully shot beautifully performed i mean it just looks like a it does it looks like a a 30 or 40 million dollar movie uh which i know wasn't that budget uh but no, it, not, even, <laughs> not even not, even, not even remotely close but i'm a huge fan of but i'm a huge fan of adrian's i mean i, I think he's a fen- fen- not only a phenomenal actor but he's got that presence about him and on screen, and uh, when I saw the trailer, I was just like, "Damn, man! It, this looks f- like I, I, I am really, uh, you know, honestly looking forward to seeing it. It's like that's a Friday night movie. That's a Saturday night movie Thank for you. me. So I'm, I'm excited about it. How did you get involved with it, man? How did you get involved with that project? Uh, well, first of all, please go see it. It's it's the best movie I've ever made. You know, um, and um, it really delivers. And, and 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 production value aside, you know, like hopefully you always tr- want the movie to look better than the money that you had, you know. But um, but you know the story just is just rock solid. The script was in such a great place even before we started to 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 do pre production. And then uh, Paul Solette, uh, and this is how I got involved. So I did another movie with the 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 co writer director Paul Solette um, called uh, Dark Summer. And, um, and Paul and I, you know, connected and hit it off. And then he went off to do a, a movie for Avi Lerner called Bullethead that had, uh, Adrian, uh, Antonio Banderas and John Malkovich. And through that experience, you know, him and Adrian started talking about something that Adrian had been wanting to do for a long time, you know, create a character that, that, that he doesn't, he didn't feel like he was being cast as, you know, and a lot of these projects are sort of cast centered like often i'll find an independent it's very common in independent film that a movie is given birth by an actor who really feels like either they're not getting enough recognition and they want to raise their profile or like adrian it's like people think of me as this like really sensitive guy and you know i i I like to be a tough guy you know i you know I, i i enjoy playing with guns i enjoy doing you know these tough guy things and 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 so, like, this is something that he really, you know, really passionately wanted to do, show this side to him. You know, it also gave him a chance to grow a beard, which, you know, if, you know, if you're ever in the casting process, it's always like if the, if the actor has a beard, it's like, OK, they got to cut their beard or else we're not going to cast. Them. Right. <laughs> right. Got a chance to, like grow a beard, you know. And um, so anyhow, so uh, Adrian and Paul, like, decide they want to make this movie. You know, they they had somebody that the, that showed uh, the willingness to 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 put up the budget, and um, and then and Paul contacted me. He said, you know, Daniel, I really think you'd be good to do this. You know, you should really meet Adrian, which was one of the most nerve wracking days of my life. Was where, um, okay, you know, they're, we're coming over to your house. You know, it's like, like my house. Like, how do I get my house? ready for an Oscar winner. Like, do I have hors d'oeuvres? Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, and I have a kid. So like, it's gotta be like clean. You know, like I just, oh. I, it was a little unnerving. It's like, Oh my gosh, you know, like how do I prepare for an Oscar winner to come to my house? Uh, but as it turned out, you know, Adrian's a, just an, a, an angel and it was all about the work from the moment they, they stepped through the door, you know, and, and, and I, I didn't have to worry about anything. Like my house was definitely fine, you know? Um, awesome. But, um, but uh, we had a conversation, you know, and, and um, you know, I said, well, you know, like I, I asked, like, what other producers are on this? And they, they said, well, you know, we're both going to get producer credit. But, you know, like there were no other like producers on it. I'm like, you know, gosh, guys, you know, I, I'm, I, I want to make this movie. I'd love to make this movie. But, you know, um, you know, producing movies like pushing a huge rock up a hill. You know, you need to have more, you know, as many hands as you can get on it, you know, and um you know, and it was, it, and it is, it's, I'm still, you know, we're coming out tomorrow and I just sent the distributor some delivery requirements still, you know, it's, it's, it's still like, <laughs> I'm not, you know, these hands trying to push the rock over the hill, you know? 
Um, but anyhow, so they, whatever I said or did, or, you know, they seemed, uh, that I would be a good fit for the film and, you know, and then we, we went off and we made it, you know, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. I'm so happy for you. Cause it looks fantastic. And, um, you know, when you reached out to me, I'm like, Hey, I got this new movie with Adrian Brody. And do you want to, do you want to have me talk about it? I was like, Oh yeah, this would be awesome. This would be a great conversation to have you come on. Uh, did you, did, were you involved in the financing and raising money or was the money in place before? That, the, I'm a physical producer, so usually uh, the, the the money is in place before it comes to me. I I'm I'm the person that can take a script through distribution and know all the all the details sure. that of what needs to go to make that happen. Um, I have raised money on occasion, but but it's not really. There's, that's why I like to have a lot of producers. Everybody has their strengths. There's some people that are just good rainmakers. Like I I don't consider myself one of them. Got yeah. it. Got it. Now, and when does it come out? Tomorrow night, today, uh, which is January twenty eighth. So, yeah, it's going to be on theaters. There's going to be yeah, we're on uh, we're on almost we're on two hundred and sixty screens around the country, um, iTunes and Amazon simultaneously. Okay, so it's a day and date. Day and date. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So it's, so you can't go watch it and rent it as well. Yes. Yeah. You can that... go to the theater. You can or you can rent it. Awesome, man. That's awesome. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all my guests. What sure. advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? I, you know, I would say there's nothing to it but to do it. You know, just make movies. You know, don't wait to be greenlit. I would say that uh, just do as much as you can. You know, like when I was at NYU Film School, I was there, a lot of the, my fellow students were like, "Oh, I'm not going to PA or I'm not going to do this," and I was like, "I'll PA. I'll do that. I'll do this. Mm-hmm. I'll run. I'll be security." You know, like just do as much as you can to get in where you fit in and do as much as you can. And you'll, you'll get a network and you'll start elevating yourself. So, you know, I, I think, and, and I would say too, producing is an entry level position. Like you, you can start producing today. You know, you don't have to wait till you climb a, a ladder to get there. If you want to produce, you know, you can go and produce something right now. I, I guarantee you. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Hmm. Well, I, you know, what I always say is that um, I don't feel like there's a lot that I need to learn about the technical aspects of filmmaking, but I've never learned enough about people. You know, if you can really focus on how to interact and with people in a way that is, like I was saying about a win-win situation or, you know, uh, you know, if you can learn how to like really work well with people, play well with others, you know, uh, you will do great, you know? And so that's, I still am learning that today, you know, how to continue to like learn how to play well with others, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess I've said this a thousand times on the show, but I can, I never get tired of saying it. Best advice I ever heard. Don't be a dick. (laughs) Because nobody wants to work. You know, you might get through this movie, but then nobody will want to work with you on the next one. It is too small. It's a very small business. It's a small business. Very small. Very small. Run into the same people over and over again. Yeah, and it's so funny. And now that I've been, I've, I've had this show for so many years, you know, I'll watch something or I'll talk to somebody, and they're like, "Oh, he's on that project. Oh, he's been on the show." Or I know that person. Or I've worked with that person, or this or that. Exactly. I just been around. You know, I've been around close to thirty years as well. So it's just like at a certain point, you run into a lot of different people in this and business. It's true. And don't true. don't be a dick. Don't screw anybody over. It will come no. back to bite you. And there are a lot of people who wash out that the film business is not for them. But the people who stay, you run into those people over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. And three of your favorite films of all time. Contact, Apocalypse Now, and um, Lawrence of Arabia. Good, good trio. Good, good. That's a good movie night. That's a good movie night. Yeah, that's a great movie night. <laughs> or just watch the whole Alien franchise from beginning to end. Oh you know? God! I mean, Alien and Aliens. Jesus, man. If you want to read a great action script, near perfection is Aliens. Cameron's Aliens. Yeah. It's just. The script is just perfection, man. What's great about too, when you watch the, all the movies back to back, you see Ripley's character arc. Just oh yeah, oh yeah. Over the over the course of the film, so that in the beginning she's terrified of these aliens, and you know by by the third movie she realizes that, like please kill me, you know, like like you know like I just keep waking up and having to deal with this this nightmare, you know, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> 
Uh, Daniel, man, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. It has been a oh, great seven. catching up with you, man. And uh, I yeah. think you, I think you've dropped a few knowledge bombs on the tribe today, and hopefully, we'll help well, well, some young producers well, and young well, filmmakers well. out there, man. So thank you, my friend. Well, and if you want more, I'm on TikTok, producer Daniel. So I, I go every day and drop a little bomb every day. So if people want more, they can get it there. We, we will put it on the show notes, my friend. Thank you again. All right, man. You take care.